But if you would, go in your Bible to Luke chapter 22. All I want to do this morning is make much of Jesus. And uh, I think that's what we should do when we assemble together. He is worthy of our praise. And uh, I want you to turn to Luke 22, verse 47. And when you get there, I want you to hold your place there. And I want you to go also to John 18. John 18. And the reason I do that, I don't, I don't do that often, but these are uh, parallel passages of the same story. And uh, the gospel according to John gives us a little bit more information that we don't find in Luke's account. And so Luke 22, verse 47, if you're there, say amen. Amen. And while he yet spake, behold, a multitude, and he that was called Judas, one of the twelve, went before them and drew near unto Jesus to kiss him. But Jesus said unto him, Judas, betrayest thou the Son of Man with a kiss? When they which were about him saw what would follow, they said unto him, Lord, shall we smite with the sword? And one of them smote the servant of the high priest and cut off his right right ear. And Jesus answered and said, Suffer ye thus far. And he touched his ear and healed him. Now hold your place in Luke and go to John 18. John 18 is going to give us a little bit more information about this event. Because all we know from Luke 22 is that there was a servant of the high priest. We don't know his name. And we know one of the followers of Jesus took a sword and sliced that servant's ear off. And um, it's a very familiar story. We read over it all the time. But I think uh, it would do us good to examine it uh, more thoroughly this morning. So John 18, verse number 1, if you're there, say amen. Amen. When Jesus had spoken these words, he went forth with his disciples over the brook Kedron, where was a garden into the which he entered, and his disciples. Now hold on just for a moment. Jesus has just been in the upper room with his disciples. Uh, They've just observed Passover. Uh, He told Peter that Peter was going to deny him three times. Jesus taught them that uh, he was going to send them a comforter. And Jesus even begins to pray for his disciples, and not just for his disciples, but even for future believers. He prayed for us. And now what he is doing is he's taking his disciples across the brook Kedron to the Mount of Olives. And on that mountain is a garden called the Garden of Gethsemane. And Jesus is going to take three of his disciples deeper into that garden to pray, Peter, James, and John. That is the scene that we see here. And verse number two, and Judas also, which betrayed him, knew the place for Jesus, Jesus oft times resorted thither with his disciples. Judas then, having received a band of men and officers from the chief priests and Pharisees, cometh thither with lanterns and torches and weapons. Jesus, therefore, knowing all things that should come upon him, went forth and said unto them, whom seek ye? They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus saith unto them, I am he. And Judas also, which betrayed him, stood with him. Listen to this. As soon then as he had said unto them, I am he, they went backward and fell to the ground. Then asked he them again, whom seek ye? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I have told you that I am he. If therefore you seek me, let these go their way, that the saying might be fulfilled which he spake, of them which thou gavest me have I lost none. (laughs) Even in the midst of all that turmoil, Jesus cared for his disciples. Then Simon Peter, ah, that's the disciple, having a sword, drew it 
and smote the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. Then said Jesus unto Peter, Put up thy sword into the sheath. The cup which my father hath given me, shall I not drink it? How many have ever heard this story before? You've read this story before. But here's what I want to do just for a few moments this morning. Is I want to examine this story. But I want to examine it from three different perspectives. We see the three main characters. John gives us the names of the two. We know that Jesus is there. So I want to look at it from Jesus' perspective. The servant of the high priest was there. That was the man who had his right ear cut off. His name was Malchus. I want to look at it from his perspective. But then I also want to look at it from Simon Peter's perspective. And I think what we'll learn here is a little bit about salvation, a little bit about what God has done for us. And I tell you, I'm excited this morning about the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's the only thing that we can glory in this morning. So preacher Ray, as we begin to preach, would you stand and pray for me as we open up the word of God? Amen. So let's look at this from the first perspective. Jesus. Point number one, we're going to call this the burdened healer. The burdened healer. Now Jesus is in this garden. And he keeps mentioning a word over and over and over again. It's just a three-letter word. That word is cup. He keeps talking about a cup. For example, he says this as he's praying, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. In John's account, he told Peter to put his sword back into the sheath. And then he said this, the cup which my father hath given me, shall I not drink it? And so we see a cup, and and there's a lot of controversy, Pastor Tyler, about this cup. What is it? What's in it? What does it represent? I've heard some people say, oh, this this is sin. This is the reality of the sin that Jesus is going to bear on the cross. I've heard it, it, it said that this cup and the bitter cup is the suffering and sacrifice that Jesus is getting ready to endure. I've heard that this cup is, is the reality of the Godhead and, and the Father is going to turn his back on the Son and, and Jesus is going to say, my God, my God, why hast thou for Forsaken me. But whatever this cup is and whatever this cup represents, I think that we can agree it's unpleasant. Whatever's in that cup is bitter. Whatever is in that cup is putrid. And Jesus is looking into that cup and he begins to have a burden. He he feels this heaviness so much that an angel has to descend from heaven to strengthen Jesus. I believe so that he will not die in that garden. So much he feels this heaviness and the reality of sin that, that Jesus, uh, the, the Bible says in, uh, in let, let me find it here. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly and his sweat was as it were great drops of blood falling down to the ground. Jesus was in complete agony in this garden. You realize what Jesus is getting ready to do for you and for me. And we see this cup. We see the burden that Jesus has on his shoulders. But then we see the capture. We see that insult to injury, one of his closest followers and friends who has just betrayed him 
who has just sold his soul for 30 pieces of silver comes with a host of officers. And Jesus, can you see him in that garden? Can you see him looking at all of them and saying, whom seek thou? And they say, Jesus of Nazareth. And he responds with just three words. I am he. And as John records, as soon as he said that, they fell backward to the ground. Do you not realize what that teaches us this morning? Do you not realize the power in the voice of Almighty God that Jesus was 100% man, but he was also 100% God? Do you not realize that just with the spoken word, he could have annihilated them? He could have destroyed them just by calling into heaven. They could, uh, the angels descend and rescue him out of that situation, but he did not do any of that. Do you see the power in what it teaches us? That Jesus in that garden reaches out his hands. He says, I am he. That teaches us this morning that nobody took his life. He willingly laid it down. He willingly gave his life for us. He allowed them to beat him. They allowed him. He allowed them to put a crown of thorns on his brow. He allowed them to scorch him. He allowed them. They couldn't do that in their own power. Oh, he gave his life and he allowed them to nail him to a cross. Oh, what a savior. But as the officers come, a man reaches out for Jesus, and Jesus sees one of his close followers, Simon Peter, who you know was a redneck. He was a fisherman. He was locked and loaded. He had a sword. If it would have been today, he would have had a Glock in his pocket. Simon Peter was a redneck, and he was ready to go. And so Jesus is looking at this scene, and he sees Simon Peter with his sword, Cut off the ear of Malchus. And even in the midst of that darkness, even in the midst of all that chaos, all of that turmoil, all of the brokenness that Jesus felt in that garden, he still had compassion for that man. He saw that man severed. He saw that man broken and he reached out his healing hand and healed that man can I tell you, I was in darkness and I was completely broken and I was completely severed. And I love what the apostle Paul declares. He said, for when we were yet without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. We were broken. We were separated from God, but Jesus died for us. And he reached out his hand and he healed us. So I see Jesus, the burdened healer. But then I see Malchus. Let's look at it from his perspective. I'm going to call Malchus the bleeding heathen. Malchus deserved what he got. To lay hands on the son of man, to lay hands on the son of God, to accuse him. I love the details of scripture. The details of scripture does not say, it, the Bible doesn't say he was a servant of the high priest. It says that he was the servant of the high priest. That's who Malchus was. And so I imagine as Annas and, and Caiaphas are are gathering all these Pharisees and all of these officers and they're with Judas and they're scheming and they're plotting against Jesus. I imagine Caiaphas uh, looks to Malchus, uh, his right-hand man, his servant, and he looks at Malchus and he says, you make sure that you go in that garden and you make sure that they get that Jesus of Nazareth and you make sure that he's brought back to me. 
and we will try him in the middle of the night with an unethical trial and then we will send him to Pilate and hopefully we will finally get him crucified. And so Malchus comes into that garden, not as a friend, but as an enemy of Christ, as an enemy of God. And Malchus is there. He approaches Jesus and he sees this redneck coming for his head with a sword. And I don't believe that Peter is like, you know, I think I'm going to chop this guy's ear off. I don't, think, I don't think he had that kind of aim or precision. I believe that Peter was wanting to cut his head off. And so, and, and you know that because, because Peter said, just, just hours before this, Peter said, oh, Jesus, I will die for you. I will even go to prison for you. I will defend you. And Malchus sees the sword and he ducks. And instead of it taking off his head, it cuts him on the side of the face and it, it cuts his ear clean off. And I imagine there's ringing I imagine there's blood, I imagine there's pain, and I imagine Malchus just falling on his knees before Jesus. And Jesus lives the example that he's taught his disciples. Oh, you're, you're to love your enemies. You're to pray for them that persecute you. Oh, you're to bless them that absolutely hate you. And he looks on this man named Malchus with compassion. What a scene. You say, Malchus didn't deserve that. I, I agree. He didn't deserve to be healed. But if he deserved it, it wouldn't be called grace. Grace. If he deserved it, it wouldn't be called mercy. And you know what I realize as I read this story and I study this story? I think about the fact that I didn't deserve it. I think about the fact that you didn't deserve it. I think about the fact that the scripture declares that you that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled. Do you not realize that you were just as much an enemy of God as Malchus was? Do you, not, do you not realize that you were completely alienated, that you were completely separated, that you were an enemy of God, that you were condemned already, but yet Jesus looked on you with compassion and he imparted grace and he imparted mercy and he reached out his head to an enemy to reconcile him back to to the Father. Amen. What a Savior. What a Savior Jesus is. And so we see Jesus, the burdened healer. We see Malchus, the bloody heathen. And then we see Peter, old Simon Peter. And we see the beautiful hope. You got, what in the world? The beautiful hope? Do you not realize what Peter did in this moment was egregious? Jesus had told them that he was going to go to the cross, that he was going to die, he was going to be buried, he was going to rise again. Peter just couldn't wrap his mind around that. But do you not realize the offense that, that Peter has made in this garden? The officers had nothing on Jesus or the disciples. It was all false. But now, oh, they've got Peter. Oh, they have him now. They have the evidence. They have him committing a, a horrible crime that is punishable by death. Oh, you don't assault and try to murder the servant of the high priest. Oh, he's going to be executed. He's going to be punished for this. And so I believe that this miracle is just as much for Peter 
as it was for Malchus. Because Jesus looks at that situation and he has so much in store for Peter. And he grabs that ear, he places it back on the head of Malchus and he gets rid of any evidence that Peter had transgressed. He got rid of any evidence that Peter did anything wrong. And so if these officers would take Peter to the high priest and say, this man has committed a great crime, there's his sword and there's the blood. He cut off the ear of Malchus. The high priest would say, bring me Malchus. And Malchus would walk in and all of the evidence would be gone. He would be fine. He would have his ear completely intact. I believe when Jesus touched his ear, all the blood and the skin and the tissue, it was all made whole. And, and the high priest at that moment would have to look at Peter and he would have to declare, these two words, not guilty, not guilty. There's no evidence of the crime, not guilty. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, the psalmist said, as far as the east is from the west, so has he removed my transgressions. Oh, where is my sin? I tell you, I can't find it. It's all gone. It's under the blood of Jesus Christ. It's almost as if this last healing miracle before the death of Christ Jesus is teaching them, this is what I'm getting ready to do for you. This is what I'm getting ready to accomplish on the cross of Calvary. I can't wrap my mind around that, Brother Sean. I'm guilty. I'm a sinner. I'm wicked. But yet on that cross, Jesus was treated the way I should be treated so that I could be treated the way Jesus should be treated. What an amazing God we serve. It's a beautiful hope. When I was a young boy... I ran around with my dad a lot, went to work with him, went fishing, golf, and played sports. My dad loved Merle Haggard. He would blast it. He would blast it in that gold lumina. He loved Merle Haggard. And pardon me for getting a little carnal for a moment. There's a point to this. Mama tried. We don't smoke marijuana in Muskogee. I'm proud to be an Okie from Muskogee, the fighting side of me, and some really questionable songs that my dad also let me listen to as a child. <laughs> Merle Haggard was, was, I cannot believe I'm talking about Merle Haggard. He was born in Bakersfield, California. He was born into poverty. He was actually born in a boxcar. Um, his dad ended up dying when he was nine years old. And, and so Merle, the, 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 he was the true outlaw country artist. He went to a life, turned to a life of, of petty crime. He escaped from jail over 10 times. And he, he committed one crime too many. One, one night he was heavily inebriated. And um, him and his buddy went to rob a local restaurant in, in Bakersfield. And he got arrested and he got convicted of armed robbery. And because of his horrible past and record, he got sentenced up to 15 years in California's most notorious maximum security prison, San Quentin. You guys know? Yeah, some of you are just as carnal as I am. While he was in prison, a famous country artist came by. 
and performed one of his most memorable, memorable concerts in San Quentin Prison. You know who it was? Johnny Cash. Yeah, you, you're really carnal. <laughs> that inspired Merle to pursue a life of music. After three years, they, they let him out of prison on good behavior, and Merle went on to be extremely successful. I mean, he's, he's one of the country music legends out there. But there was something still that haunted him. He was still a convicted felon. He was still a convicted criminal. He couldn't, when he was on tour, he couldn't go out of, uh, out of the country without declaring, hey, this is my legal, you know, this is my legal history. I'm, I'm a convicted criminal. And that really haunted him because he, he wanted so badly to move away from that and to get past it, but he never could. And then something amazing happened in 1972. The governor of California, whose name, and it's hard to believe, was Ronald Reagan. It's hard to believe that he was the governor of California. He reviewed Merle Haggard's history, and he reviewed his case. And on March 14th, 1972, he pardoned Merle Haggard of all of his criminal records. And in that moment, with just a swipe of a pen, his criminal past was gone. He didn't have to declare anything. Merle Haggard in an interview said this, you got this tail hanging on you and suddenly you don't have it anymore. It's just wonderful not to have to walk up and say, pardon me, before I do this, I want to tell you that I'm an ex-convict. You have to do that with any sort of legal transaction, with leaving the country, with anything of that nature. All of those things went away when Ronald Reagan was kind enough to look at my case and give me a pardon. The pardon had transformed my life. Having that burden lifted is an incredible feeling. Can I tell you this, that more important than a, an earthly temporal uh, pardon from a, an executive of, of a state, can I tell you how much greater it is to be eternally pardoned by the God of heaven and that my sin, just by the snap of a finger, my sin is all gone. My sin is all gone. I'm not guilty anymore. And he gives unto me eternal life and I shall never perish. Amen. Amen. Who knew Merle Haggard would help us in a sermon? Can I tell you that God offers that to everyone? And to think that people deny him and reject him blows my Mind that he could wipe my slate clean. Therefore, there is now no, no condemnation. You made some mistakes as a teenager. There's no condemnation. You must made some mistakes as an adult. There's therefore now no condemnation. Not because you've earned it, not because you've been a good person. Oh, but that the, the, the justifier could be just and justifier at the same time. And through repentance and faith in the gospel of Jesus Christ, I can be forgiven. Do you realize what God has done for you? Who would have thought that this little miracle that we find in the garden could be packed with so much truth? And I say, I just want to worship him. I just want to praise him all the days of my life. He is worthy. He has taken my sin upon himself, and it's all under the blood of Jesus Christ. We know that Satan goes up to the throne and he accuses the brethren. Can you believe that Pastor Chad did that? Can you believe 
that Zach did that. Can you believe that Mike Davis did that? And God looks at Satan and says, I don't know what you're talking about. I, I don't see anything. I don't see anything. You know why? Because Jesus has taken my sin completely out of the way and he has justified me and he has saved me. And to that I say to God be the glory. Amen. Everyone stand with your head bowed and your eyes closed. Lois is going to go to the keyboard. I wonder, is there anyone in here you're not sure you've been pardoned? You've not, you're not sure that you've experienced true salvation. And you might say, if I die today, I'm not 100% sure I'd go to heaven. Would you please slip up your hand? Anyone at all? Anyone at all? I'm not sure. I tell you, if you're not sure, you need to come up here and get it right before you leave. Amen. Christian... When's the last time you thanked Jesus for doing all of that for you? When's the last time you just knelt in honor and reverence to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords and just said, God, thank you. Oh, this would be a great time for you to come forward and just say, Jesus, thank you for doing all of that for me. Thank you for forgiving me. Thank you for dying for me. Thank you for cleansing me. Thank you, thank you, thank you. You're worthy of all praise. How many of you know of someone who's never experienced pardon and forgiveness of sins? They've never been brought nigh by the blood of Jesus. How about you come and pray for them that they'd get saved? Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, as people are coming, I pray that you just bless this time of offering, uh, of invitation, Lord. And Lord, it, it really is a time of offering, Lord, as we offer our lives to you, a, a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God. But Lord, I pray that you bless this time of invitation now. In Jesus' name I pray.